orphan. I was an orphan. I didn't know my father. I was alone. Helpless. Helpless. I had no family. I didn't belong to anyone. To anyone. To anyone. I was an orphan. No one saw me. No one knew me. I was invisible. I was lost. I was lost. No one claimed me. No one said, he's mine. She's mine. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was hungry. Like all the food in the world couldn't fill me up. I was vulnerable. Unprotected. At risk. Cold. Tired. Tired. I'm tired. I thought I didn't matter. I thought no one cared. No one cared. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. But I was found. But I was found. I was found. Someone stepped in. And someone saw me. I was sought. Pursued. Wanted. Known. I was an orphan. But now I belong. Now I belong. Now I belong. I'm embraced. A sister. A brother. I know my father. I know my father. I know my father. I was an orphan. But I am loved. Great cost. I am restored. I am restored. And for the first time, I know that I am valued, prized, forever. 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 I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. We're all orphans. So I care for orphans. So I care for orphans. I was an orphan. So I care for orphans. Today is, is a day that has been set aside as Orphan Sunday, a day to bring um, understanding that so many people in our world and in our country have no family. And this morning we're going to look at not only orphans, but throughout scripture, scripture has a lot to say about people such as orphans who, who we would say are the, the most vulnerable people in our society. People who, who don't necessarily have access to all of the things that maybe we take for granted. Before we do that, let's go to God in prayer at this time. Father God, it is wonderful to be able to, to simply say those words, that you are our Father. God, we thank you that, that you have made us your children. That no matter what our um, earthly family looks like, that if we are saved by the blood of your Son, that we are a part of a family that we have been adopted, we have been given hope, we have been given a family, we have been given a future. And God, we thank you for that this morning. But God, I also acknowledge and realize that, that God, there are so many that cannot say that. There are so many that, that don't have a family here on this earth, a place to call home, and how will they ever really come to know you if somebody doesn't adopt them into their family? If your people don't reach out to those who are without a people, without a father, without a mother, without a family to call their own. And so God, I pray that as we open your word this morning that, that it would simply be your words to us this morning, God, because it, you say it so many times. That if we have been chosen and redeemed and saved by you, then we are called to go out and do the same for other people. Work on our hearts this morning, God. Change us individually. Change us as a church. And it's your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 17 through 21. You should not pervert the justice due to the sojourner 
or to the fatherless, or take a widow's garment and pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. We're going to look at uh, a number of passages together this morning. We're not going to dive deep into each one, but we're going to read some passages together that are going to relate to this idea. But before we really get there, I think we need to understand where we are coming from. And so the last few times that I've been up here in front of you, we've been talking about, okay, what does it look like to follow Jesus? But really, what it looks like to follow Jesus happens in light of, in view of the mercies of God. Because God has done this for me, then my life should naturally, should out of response to that, should by the Spirit of God working in me, look like this. So what... Has God done for us? I think number, if we look at this passage and the idea that the Israelites were being called to care for the less for fortunate among them, God says, because you were just like them. Because you were slaves in Egypt. Because you were a people without, truly without a home in Egypt. Because you were oppressed and without, truly without everything that you needed in Egypt, because you had that experience and I saved you from that, then this is what your reality should be now. Church, we have to understand this morning, if we are in Christ, we have been set free. That's where we've got to start. Just like the Israelites, they had to realize they were only free because God set them free. They didn't gain that on their own. You and I have to realize that spiritually, in the presence of God, we have been set free. But that is only by the work of God. If you read in the New Testament, in, in the book of Romans, in chapter 6, you read where you were once a slave of sin. And because a slave of sin, the consequences of that was death. There was no hope for us. There was nothing in the world that we could possibly do to, to release ourselves from that slavery. But because of the grace of God, we are now slaves of righteousness. But if slaves of righteousness, then that, that leads to a different type of life altogether. We are not who we once were. We are not subject to what we once were. were. We are not mastered by the things we once were mastered by, but we are are a people that serve God. So as we look at it, as we think about back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24, and it talks more than once about the orphans, the widows, the sojourners. Scripture makes it clear that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. That once we did not have a family, now we have a family. Once we did not have a father, once we were orphans, and now spiritually we have been adopted into the family of God, and we call him our father. Scripture, the New Testament makes it clear, makes this analogy that we as the church are the bride of Christ. That once upon a time we, we were a people without a groom. We were a, a wife without a husband to provide and to protect and to care for us. And now we are the bride of Christ. Once we were not a people having no home to really call our own, we were spiritually poor and bankrupt and having no hope whatsoever. But now, we are a people of God. 
Once we had not received the mercy of God, but now we are a people who have received the mercy of God. So because of all that, if we truly understand, okay, what has God done for me? Where was I before and where am I now? That's not a big deal, right? It's a huge deal, church. Do we understand exactly where we were and where we are right now? Big difference. And so because of that, and because of the Spirit of God living in us, something is going to be different about the way we live our lives. A people who have been redeemed, a people have, who have been justified, who, have, who were once sinners and God is now called saints, now called his children, should naturally be a people committed to showing justice and mercy to others. <laughs> Author and minister David Platt says this, We care for orphans not because we are rescuers, but because we are the rescued. Because we have been saved, because we have been given a new life in Christ. Then what we ought to be about as a people is extending that to others. And certainly our, our call as the, the children of God is to go out and make disciples and to make followers of Jesus Christ. But all throughout the scripture, we see that people who have been redeemed by God, who have been saved by God, who have been justified, may have been called right before God's sight, are people who care for the less fortunate within the world. And throughout, so throughout scripture, we see the heart of God for what someone has termed uh, the phrase, the quartet of the vulnerable. The quartet of the vulnerable. Who is that? That's the widows. That's the orphans. That's the, the aliens or, or, or foreigners, sojourners, immigrants, and the poor. All throughout scripture, we see verses saying, if you're going to be my people, these are the people you're going to be caring for. If you are my people, these are the people you are not going to exploit, you are not going to persecute. These are the people you will care for. And so, um, this morning, I want to look at, number one, some verses that show us, okay, just what is the heart of God for people like this? And then what does he call us to do? Who does he call us to be in light of this? So number one, Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 18. If you want, let's read these aloud, if, if you don't mind that together, let's read them aloud. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and does not take bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Next, Psalm 68, 5. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Psalm 146. He executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. We have a God who cares for those who are less fortunate. And you know, there's, I'm challenged, church, because we'll say things like, well, I, I am, I'm very blessed, okay? Or I live in a blessed nation. And I don't, there's, I'm not saying there's, that's not true. But I think 
there's a danger in that when we equate having all of our physical needs met, that we are blessed. Because what does that say to the person that doesn't have their physical needs met? What does it say to the nation of people that's living on less than $2 a day? What does that say to the child who has never known mother or father? God cares for the fortunate and the unfortunate. And the challenge for us, church, is that Hey, we can look around and say, God, why is there so much poverty? Why are there so many kids that don't have a home? Why are there so many widows who are not being cared for, who have no children or no husband to, to provide for their needs? And church, I am confident that if we ask God that question, he turns to us and says, look, you are my body. If this is the situation, what are you doing? If you are my people, if you have experienced my love and my mercy, if you have been accepted into my family, if I am your father and I have given you a family when you didn't have one, why are you not doing that for other people? And so we see that. We see this message throughout scripture that God calls his people to care for and provide for the most vulnerable in society. I'm going to read a few verses. You just follow along. Exodus 22, 22. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Leviticus 19, 34. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 29, at the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Job 31, 16 through 22, if I have withheld anything that the poor desired or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail or have eaten my morsel alone and the fatherless has not eaten of it. For from my youth the fatherless grew up with me as with a father and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or the needy without cover, um, if his body has not been blessed, not blessed me and if he has was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep. If I have raised my hand against the fatherless because I saw my help in the gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from my shoulder and let my arm be broken from its socket. Proverbs 14, 31. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Isaiah 1, 17. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. And if you think at that moment, well, uh, those are all Old Testament verses, right? We, we don't necessarily follow all the Old Testament anymore, anymore right? That is, is that really a requirement for me now? Well, let's turn to the New Testament and see what he has to say. Before we read these verses, I want you to, to think about and, and maybe go home today and look at uh, the last part of Matthew chapter 25. Where Jesus has what he calls the sheep and the goats. And he's, he's pronouncing judgment on these people. And he says... He pronounces blessing on the sheep. Why? Because when he was hungry, they gave him something to eat. When he was thirsty, they gave him something to drink. When he was naked, they clothed him. When he was in prison, they came to visit him. And they, they turn to him and they say, when did we see you in these needs? And Jesus says, as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. And it really seems like that whole section is saying that, that look, if you expect to 
to be in my kingdom for eternity, these are the people you're going to be caring for. James 1, 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. 1 John 3.17, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Anybody feel convicted yet? You know, church, uh, as, as a minister, as somebody who stands in front of you regularly, if, if I step on your toes, realize that, that all week I've been doing it to myself, okay? Not just because I'm clumsy, although that's, that can be true, but because the word of God is convicting. And I can be pretty selfish. But the word of God doesn't leave much room for me to be selfish. The needs of so many in our society don't leave me much room to be selfish. That if I have truly been given and blessed so much by God, I should have no excuse for being idle, for not doing anything. And so let me share with you some statistics. But before that, before that, how do we respond, okay? So we realize that God wants us and desires us to meet the needs of the vulnerable. How do we respond to this? What do we do? Number one, open your eyes to see the needs around you. Open your eyes to see the needs around you. It doesn't, you don't have to go far to see somebody who is in need that it's a need that they're going to have a really hard time meeting on their own. And church, sometimes we're guilty. We're guilty of judging why people are in the position that they are. Well, they're, they're poor, or they're in that position because of, of their own poor choices. Okay. Even if that is true, what if God came to us and said, hey, you are going to, you're going to hell because of the choices that you've made. Could he say that? Does it, is it anything within me that, that brings my own salvation? According to scripture, it is, it is not. That I am in the position that I am spiritually when I come to God. And God doesn't say, look, you should have tried harder, right? You should have picked yourself up by your own bootstraps. You should have figured out how to get yourself out of this position. No. He says, I sent my son to die so that you could be redeemed. Let's not judge why people are in the position they are. Let's just lift them up. So again, some statistics. Number one, widows. The rate of poverty among elderly widows is three to four times higher than that of their married peers. The median income of women over the age of 65 is only about $17,000. There are 258 million widows worldwide and half of them live in extreme poverty. Orphans. There are 153 million orphans around the world. 153 million orphans. Aliens, foreigners, sojourners, immigrants, however we want to say that. There are 70.8 million refugees worldwide. The poor. Almost half of the world's population lives on less than $2.50 per day. Over half, there are over half a million homeless 
and the United States. An estimated 40.3 million, there are an estimated 40.3 million victims of human trafficking. And I could give multiple more statistics and say there are so many people in our world that are being oppressed. I could share with you, as I've shared before, the story of our own son, born in China, born with physical problems that his parents could not afford to, to meet. And so he's placed under a tree. And I don't know how long he laid there, crying, waiting for somebody to pick him up. But Judah is just one example. Judah is just one example of children that are born and children that are not cared for. Is it their fault? It's not. Do we care for those in need? Before we can care, we've got to see them. We've got to see them. And honestly see them and really understand their situation. Just this week uh, in the, the Christian Chronicle, which is a newspaper uh, done by the Churches of Christ, uh, there was an article about the, the new president of Pepperdine University out in Malibu, California. And he shares a story of how um, 10 years ago, he, he decided he would go on a, a mission trip. Basically, going on a mission trip to say he had been on one, he was a good Christian, you know, he did the Christian thing and went on a mission trip. But that was going to be his one and only trip. He was going to go one time, and that was going to be the last time he'd ever go. He was in the, the law department of, of Pepperdine University, and they went into a prison while they were in, they went to Uganda. And they went into this prison where it was a prison for, for mostly uh, younger people. And he met a 14, I think he was a 14-year-old boy at the time, a 14-year-old boy who was accused of murder, a murder that he did not commit. But he found himself in prison at the age of 14. And he said, he said, this is not right. This isn't right. Today, he's been to Uganda 27 times. And one time turned into 27 times. And that young man is free. And that young man is becoming an ophthalmologist. Where would he be if it weren't for the mercy of this man? Where could somebody else be if it were for our mercy, for your mercy? How different could somebody's life be because you said, this is not right, I'm going to step in and I'm going to do what I can to change it. So number two, open your hearts to experience compassion for others. Open your hearts to experience compassion for others. And before we can experience compassion, we've got to see people. We've got to look past our own lives and look to the lives of others around us. Open your heart. Experience. I know some people live in a, a situation that you can never comprehend because that has never been your experience. But can you put yourself in somebody else's position and think about what would that be like? How would it be to sit in a, in a one-room prison with, with many other people who probably many of others are innocent as well, knowing that, that there's no justice coming your way because you live in a nation that has a, a really poor um, judicial system? What would it be like to sit in an orphanage, orphanage knowing that, hey, there's nothing I can do to promote myself. I just got to hope that somebody comes along and says, I, I want them to be a part of my family.
Maybe this sounds like one of those infomercials you see on TV or whatever where it's saying, you know, send your money to, to this or that organization. And certainly money can make a difference, but you can make a difference. At James 1.27, um, if we look at that again, James 1.27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. It's not to, to send your money so that somebody else cares for them and you don't have to interact with that person. Though again, there's nothing wrong with that. Our family gives money every month to a little girl uh, in Africa who is in need. We, we have never met her. We've seen pictures of her, but uh, there's a good chance we will never meet her in our lives. But there are people that are not far away from you at all that find themselves in these positions. Rather than just giving of resources, are we giving of ourselves to, to know people, to interact with people, to build relationships with people who are in need? Open your hearts to experience compassion for others. Finally, open your hands, and in some cases, open your homes to the vulnerable. I don't know how that's going to look for you. I don't know what that experience is going to be like for you. I don't know who that person is, who that, that individual, who that family is, that, that this might apply to you. But if we have the world's goods and see somebody in need and don't do something about it, there's a problem. And I think scripture makes it pretty clear it's a heart problem. That I don't, I don't really, I have not really internalized the fact that I have been saved, I have been redeemed, I have been justified. Because if I would truly understand that, then I would give justice to those who need justice. I would give mercy to those who need mercy. So what is it going to look like for you to open up your hands, open up your homes, open up whatever it is that you can provide to meet the needs of somebody in our community, in our world that, that is vulnerable? What is it that we as a church could do? We've got a homeless shelter right next door, church. I'll be the first to admit I, I don't interact enough at all over there. I wish I had numbers. I don't have numbers. But how many children in our town, in our county, don't have a family right now? How many of you have an extra room at your house? What if we were the church in town where people said, look, if you don't have a family, that church will be your family. What if we were the, the church in town that said, look, if you don't have a mother and father, there is somebody in that church that would love to care for you. What if we were the church that, that if, if you were somebody that you don't have children that live nearby, you don't have a husband or you don't have a wife anymore, there, there's nobody that even comes to visit you. What if we were the family that says, you're our, our responsibility, you're our family. Church, we see in, in Acts that, that when the, the church grew and, and when it was growing, it was growing uh, in part, because it was a community of people that said, look, if you're among us and you don't have your needs met, we're going to do whatever we can, even if it comes down to selling some of our own stuff so that we can take care of you. What kind of church are we going to be? We're going to continue to be a church that makes uh, disciples, that helps to grow disciples, but in the process, we need to be a church that is showing mercy and compassion to people. So what is that going to look like? What is it going to look like for you? What is it going to look like for us as a church? It's so easy, church, to, to talk about this and to walk out the doors and Forget all about it. 
that's not okay. It can't, it can't be. How are you going to get involved? What are you going to do? And, um, you know, the need was brought to my wife and I this morning. Lisa Rose is here from out of town. It's great to see her back in town. And uh, most of you know that uh, Dravian has been living with her for how many years now? Okay, a long time. And I don't know how many of you saw on Facebook recently how wonderful he's doing in school. If you know Lisa and if you've seen them, you've seen the love that she has given this child that is not biologically related to her. She's right now trying to go through the process of legally adopting Dravian. And I can tell you from experience, that is not a cheap thing to do. Um, how can you support Lisa today? What can you do to, to help her in meeting the, this young boy's needs? If it weren't for that, would, Dravian would not know the love of God. This is just one example, church. I could speak to, to others, and I hope I hear more and more stories of people making difference in the life of somebody else. You've been adopted into a family that was not originally your own. How will you make somebody else a part of your family? We're going to sing a song, and... Um, Whatever your need is this morning, if you need us to pray for you, if you are in the process of contemplating how, what am I going to do? What difference am I going to make in somebody's life? We would love to dream with you and, and talk about that. If you're here this morning and you are not a part of the family of God, God wants you to be. God wants you to be his child. God will, with open arms, invite you into his family. And we would love to talk to, with you about how that takes place. Whatever your need is this morning, please come as we stand and sing.